our resentments are connected to our fears. <laughs> like absolutely connected at almost a molecular level because basically what we're fearing is a loss of control. If you think about it, that's the overarching principle or the foundation of fears like that. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy. A Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges, spirituality, ADHD, or maybe just family, travel, and logistics. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison, with your mystery meat sandwich. Greetings, compadres. Okay, it's May, and last month we did step four in April, and we started talking about the purpose of doing an inventory. It's a personal inventory, right? And we talked about how businesses have to do an inventory so they can understand what they have going for them that's working, not working, and so that they can analyze the stock and trade. And we do a personal housekeeping similar to that same concept anyway. In the fourth step, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory. So in the fifth step, what we're going to do is we are going to basically go over that fourth step. And in doing so, we're going to, we're going to become uh, honest with ourselves and with another human being and before God and really get real with the exact nature of our wrongs. So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack the remainder of the fourth step. And when I went over the fourth step in April, I went over this concept of what I'm calling a pizza, a fourth step pizza. And I divided this proverbial pizza up into thirds. And there, so there are three parts to this pizza. I was talking about how, you know, you can order a half and half kind of pizza, half cheese, half pepperoni. Well, this one is thirds. And we talked all about the first third of that pizza, which is resentments. So we can link that. You can go back, hear all about it. But basically, we talked about, you know, the basic human instincts right, for security, emotional and financial security, and a place in society, and the sex relation. These are all human instincts. And so the other two thirds of the pizza, we're going to talk about today. And so technically, you would still be in your fourth step at this time, as we talk about the third of the pizza that is fears, and the third of the pizza that is sex and other harms. So by the time you complete this, in theory, what you would do is you would get together with your sponsor and you would go over your fourth step. And when you do that, it is called a fifth step. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. And so what I'm going to start by doing is talking about the concept of sponsorship. I think sponsorship is a really weird word to use for this. Um, And in 12-step fellowships, which by the way, I just want to remind everyone that I endorse them. They do not endorse me. So I endorse any 12-step fellowship like Alcoholics Anonymous, um, they do not endorse me. All right. So the concept of sponsorship 
it's really weird, right? Because I think of, you know, a jersey or, you know, some kind of a sports team who is sponsored by a company, right? And while that's sort of the loose idea of sponsorship in 12-step fellowship, and I'm not going to go super deep into it, but what I will say is this. A sponsor should be, as far as I understand it in my studies, a sponsor should be somebody who takes you through the 12 steps. So a sponsor should not tell you what to do with your life. A sponsor should not lend you money. A sponsor should not do a myriad of bizarre things that I personally have seen over the years. Um, you know, move in with you. A sponsor should do nothing like that, okay? A sponsor is there to take you through the 12 steps, period. You can switch sponsors. If you start working with somebody and you don't care for the style of how they're doing things, maybe they're a little bit too um, overbearing, overstepping boundaries, um, all of this. You have perfect freedom to thank that sponsor for their time and move on to somebody else who you feel you could have a better experience with for your sake. Because never forget that this whole idea of recovery from anything is for you. This is for you, your personal freedom and your life. And you got to fight for this. You know what I'm saying? It's like you have cancer and you go to one doctor and that doctor is super rude and not compassionate at all and is just full of um, advice for you that there's one way to do things and this is the way and and it just rubs you the wrong way, you know, and you're just like, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm on borrowed time and I'm going to go ahead and find somebody else, <laughs> right? And that sponsor, if they are a healthy non-toxic sponsor, they will want your recovery more than anything else. Some sponsors tend to be very attached to, you know, I have this many sponsees and blah, 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 blah. And um, I'm amazing. I always sponsor the same way. I developed all of these methods, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you're one of 20,000 sponsees that I have. And on the weekends, by the way, they all come over and mow my lawn and clean my toilets. And that to me is crazy and totally inappropriate. And so since the whole point of being a sponsor is to help you through the 12 steps, if you need a different experience because a different experience could keep you sober, that's what that sponsor should want for you and should graciously wish you well on your journey. That's my opinion. And it's my opinion <clears throat> because the concept of sponsorship is not in the big book, okay? In the first chapter of the big book, in Bill's story, there is a, uh, a part where... Bill's old schoolmate, Ebby, comes to the kitchen. Bill is drinking. Ebby shares the steps with Bill. And that is Bill's exposure to the 12 steps, his original exposure to the 12 steps. Okay? And so, but it, it never says Ebby is Bill's sponsor in the big book, just to be clear. There is... Um, in AA literature from the General Service Office in New York, there is a pamphlet on sponsorship that you can read, and it's very helpful, and it's far more in-depth than what I'm giving you now. But Bill Wilson, he actually had a guy named Father Ed Dowling, who he considered 
to be more of he Ed had more of a sponsorship role, basically, is what I'm saying in Bill's life. And Ed Dowling, interestingly enough, actually struggled with food addiction. And so I bring this whole point up just because I want you to see that the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 and 12 and any of this literature is applicable to any addiction, okay? So it's not just alcohol. You can take the word alcohol throughout the big book and you can actually cross it out. And you can write whatever you want. In Al-Anon, they have us cross out alcohol and they write, uh, they have us write thinking, okay? Because, you know, the tendency is to want to try and control uh our qualifier or whoever it is who is making us crazy and we're allowing them to take up all of this rent space in our brains. Um, You can cross out alcohol and put gambling, food, sex, whatever you want. So I'm just bringing up Father Ed Dowling so that you understand. Yeah, no, addiction is addiction across the board. Um, So what you're going to look for when you are completed, well, when, when you've completed your fourth step is a person to share this with. So if you don't have a sponsor, it's okay. You can use any kind of a therapist, a priest, um, any kind of a counselor, maybe a trusted friend. The one thing I would say is that a jag of self-sponsorship doesn't usually work because especially when you're new, or at least this was my experience, self can't see self, okay? What I did a lot of the times was I couldn't get past the resentment part of the pizza, and I would justify everything. But what about this? But what about that? And I would just kind of That was my cross to bear. I would just kind of hang everything on what somebody else did to me. And I couldn't get past that, if that makes any sense. And so especially when we're new and our self-awareness is kind of super low, (laughs) it's just a great idea at that time to have a professional or a sponsor be able to be a listening ear. And a lot of times when somebody starts sharing their fourth step at their fifth step meeting, it's bizarre because the person giving the fourth step starts to see things when they speak their fourth step out loud that they couldn't see before. And it's kind of magical, I'm not going to lie. There's definitely a layer of spirituality that is present, and it's incredible to be a part of it. Okay, (laughs) so moving on. Today we're going to talk about that third of the pizza, which is fears, and then we'll close with the sex portion. Yay. All right. So I'm going to start with a reading. This is from page 68 of chapter 5 in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So these are our instructions on how to do our list of fears. So we've done the resentments. Now we're on the list of fears. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. Okay, I'm going to pause right there and give you a little sidebar. So at this point, generally, we cannot see what our fears are because we've just come off of the resentments, okay? And so we are starting to list all kinds of fears. All right, I'm afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of heights. I'm afraid of um, car accidents, this, that, and the other thing. But P.S. is coming soon, is that our resentments are connected to our fears, (laughs) like absolutely connected at almost a molecular level, because basically what we're fearing, 
is a loss of control. If you think about it, that's the overarching principle or the foundation of fears like that. Snakes, uh, spiders, you know, fear of flying, fear of um, fast cars. I don't know, right? These things are about control and powerlessness, interestingly, right? And so at this point, when we're doing our fourth step, and sliding into the fifth step now because we're sharing it with somebody else. We are still a little bit stuck on the whole idea of resentments, but we are bridging that gap now where magically or spiritually we are starting to see things formulate and take shape. So it's like one of those capsules. Have you ever done this before? They usually come in like a Happy Meal at McDonald's or um, like a kid's. It's They're found in toy stores. It's a capsule. You put it in water and then all of a sudden the capsule breaks and this sponge that is shaped in like a dinosaur or some kind of animal begins to pop out of this capsule and this sponge develops over, you know, the course of like two minutes or something. And you're like, whoa, it was a pill. And now it's, you know, a Komodo dragon. So that's what we're doing is we're at that sort of middle stage where we're watching all of this unfold. And during the resentment part of our fourth step, we started to be able to see how the world and its people really dominated us, right? That we have all these resentments and they're all because we feel attacked, right? And that, you know, someone is voodooing us, or at least this is how I felt, okay? And so we put down all the fears we can think of, and even if we can't see how they relate to any resentment at all. Okay, so continuing with the reading, we asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? So there's that control, right? That desire for control. All right. Self-reliance was as good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. All right. So I just want to quickly, one more sidebar, give you one little last nugget, which is when we talked about those instincts, those desires for a place in society, right? And financial security, emotional security, it's that, that what do I need to feel okay question, right? That is what we're asking. And so it's clearly that I'm afraid of something, which is, I am afraid of losing something that I already have, that I think I need, something that I don't have, that I think I want or need, and I can't differentiate my wants from my needs. So I roll in here, I've got resentments, I think that I'm deserving or needing these particular things, I'm not getting them or getting enough of them. And so I'm realizing through this process, oh, well, I'm just afraid because self-reliance has failed me. I need these additional things to feel okay. So that's where we're at. I hope that makes sense. Okay, back to the reading. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. Perhaps, and, and that cockiness just kind of means like, oh, I can solve my own problems. I'm still clinging to some strings of self-reliance, right? Okay, back to the reading. Perhaps there is a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. Remember the second and third step, right? So I've turned my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand Him. We trust infinite God rather 
than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. Okay, so when I rolled into my 12-step fellowship, I had calamity My life was calamity. My entire life could be defined as calamity. And so through the 12 steps, I'm going to achieve serenity, sign me up, add to cart, right? Like that's what I want. Okay, we never apologize. I'm in the reading again now. To anyone for depending on our creator, We can laugh at those who think spirituality the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. So this isn't promising, y'all, that you will get to the end of this process and be fearless, right? This is but a commencement to outgrow fear. And the commencement that we are talking about at this stage is simply listing fears. That is all we are doing. For us to try and work on our phobias and all kinds of different, you know, things that we're afraid of and emotional abandonment, all this stuff, like this is a lifetime of work for me personally and for most people I know in the 12-step fellowships who have years upon years of sobriety. Like we're talking 30 plus years. I know of folks who are like, oh yeah, no, I'm still afraid. This is simply a commencement to outgrow fear. This is a lifelong journey, okay? So I'm saying that to you so that you can set your expectations, okay? We are looking, as we list out these fears, we are looking in this entire fourth step pizza for the root cause, the fear under the fear, All right, so we're looking for those umbrella fears or foundational fears, okay? What are the high-level fears that really sum up what we're afraid of? And I already listed some of them, you know, these instinctual fears that I'm I'm not going to get what I need, right? But I can't determine the difference between a need and a want. And if I'm really looking back at my life, my needs are always met. Always, always met. Sometimes not on my timeline. Sometimes not in the way that I would desire. But my needs are always met. And that is another way that I trust my creator. So again, this God stuff, if this is bothering you, just try and set it aside and just listen, just let this wash over you. Because of course, your higher power is one of your own choosing. So try not to let the pronouns bother you. These are readings straight from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I have to read them as they're written. Just try to set it aside if you're at all offended. Okay, so we're going to start asking ourselves and doing some writing about fear. So 
I'm going to list my fears and then I'm going to look for patterns. Remember, we talked about um, like those magic eye posters where you're staring at the poster and all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's the Karate Kid and Mr. Miyagi, right? Appearing off of what looks like a jumbled mess when we first start looking at that poster, right? This is the same thing. You want to look for patterns, okay? So big triggers for me are like, you know, fear of being wrong, right? Fear of getting something slightly incorrect that somebody else uh, corrects me on. All of that stuff is fear of looking dumb. Well, what's that? It is fear that I'm not enough, right? Not enough for myself, not enough for others. You got to kind of dig for the fear under the fear. And the best way to do that is by looking at that list of fears and then drawing an arrow next to each one. Or this is another thing that I sometimes have people do. This is another option. You can connect fears. You can highlight fears all in different colors so that they really pop out and you start to see, oh, this is the same thing. You know, this is, you know, the my partner, my fear of my partner leaving me, my fear of uh, my partner falling in love with somebody else, my fear of my partner not um, disclosing things to me anymore. All of that is fear of being alone, right? Being alone and especially being like alone and sober to try and navigate the world. Like, you know, if I were brand new, it's like, I don't know that I can do that, right? So you got to sort of dig for that fear under the fear. And however it is that you can see those connections and see those patterns come to life and make sense of this puzzle, then that's perfect. Um, a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, I draw like a line next to the fear. And then I'll write what I think the fear might be. And then as I go through the list of fears, maybe I change my mind. Like, no, actually, that's not it. It's this instead. Or usually what it is, is there's actually something underneath that, right? Well, it's fear of rejection, but really what it is, for example, is I'm afraid that somebody won't like me. And if I'm afraid that that person won't like me, I'm afraid they won't give me what I think I want, which relates back, of course, to the instincts. <laughs> so all of this stuff is connected, and you will start to see that. It's a little bit difficult to explain um, over podcast, over just an audio format, but hopefully this is making a measure of sense. And I know it does sound a little bit vague, but you will start to see these patterns and be able to pull them out because you're starting to see through different lenses, right? It's pretty incredible and it's an amazing process. Okay, the other thing we want to ask ourselves is, you know, did I do anything to start the ball rolling on this fear? Did I, you know, watch something that sort of triggered, oh, my partner might leave me or might have an affair or whatever? You know, you want to figure out, gosh, you know, what am I filling my head with that this might become something that occupies all of this brain power for me. In the big book, um, in another part, it talks about, you know, how the, our fears are fancied or real. Like it, 
doesn't even matter if our fears are fancied or real if we're sitting around ruminating on something that we fear. So a good question to ask ourselves as we go through this list of fears and open our mind to what God would reveal to us about them is, is this even true? Like in um, Brene Brown's work, you know, she says, the story I'm telling myself is, and that's like the perfect question for this third of the pizza, this fears third of the pizza, is the story I'm telling myself is blah, 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 blah. Well, when we stand back and look at it, we get really honest with ourselves and we go, is that true? Like, is that fear actually occurring right now? Or is it a story that I've made up in my mind? Is that fear something in the future that could happen? Or is it something that I've completely fabricated and then decided is going to probably happen if, right? And it's really shocking, but what we realize is how much time we spend creating things that aren't there. And when we start to unpack all of that and unpeel the layers and just take things at face value, we look at our resentments totally differently. We look at that first third of the pizza with totally different lenses. And we go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe the way I'm seeing that resentment and have clung on to it for all these years isn't even correct. Maybe it's not even accurate. And that is eye-opening, like nobody's business, right? And you know what it says when we start to be able to think that way and to see the other perspective? That, you guys, is freaking freedom. That's what that is. It is true freedom because it lets the emotional gas out of that really tight, pressurized feeling of the resentment, you know, that the resentment gives us. Okay, so the last third of this fourth step pizza is sex and other harms. And wait for this little chestnut. Guess what page you will find the directions for the sex inventory on? Yes, it is page 69 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You saw that one coming, didn't you? All right, so this gang is not as difficult or as cringy as it sounds. Um, what we're going to do is start by reading a little chunk from page 69. Now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there. But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes. Absurd extremes, perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the orbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, 
dishonest or inconsiderate. Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down in paper and looked at it. In this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? We asked God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised and loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. Such a good, good little sentence right there. Okay, continuing the reading. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? Some people tell us so, but this is only a half-truth. It depends on us and our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we're not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. It takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. So, here's what we're going to do, gang. I want you to understand what the bottom line is of this. So, we're going to just take a little look at that. The bottom line of doing the sex inventory is looking at our motives, right? Why did I behave the way I did? Why do I behave the way I do, right? Because all of us have opportunities to be deceitful in our sexuality, whether that's what we do, why we do it, with whom we do it, with whom we did whatever it is that we did that harmed somebody else, we all have these tendencies to use our sexuality to, hmm, surprise, here it is again, <laughs> to get our instincts met, right? To provide for us the things that we think we need or the things that we want, right? So maybe for some of us, 
we used our sexuality to feel loved. I know that's super common in a lot of us who were raised um, in the church in the 1980s and 90s, where you suddenly, you go from, you know, oh, this is bad, 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 now this is good, but I'm trying to fill this hole and this void, and so I'm going to fill it with relationships that, you know, I want to feel loved in because I haven't had a lot of relationship experience yet, whatever it is, okay? Maybe um, the lower nature type folks were just kind of animalistic in some cases. And, you know, I've been there too. We've all been there at different points in our lives and our experiences, or most of us have. And there are different reasons and motives why we choose to conduct our sexuality the way that we do. Okay, maybe there are some of us who are polyamorous. Maybe some of us are questioning different uh, gender assignments. Maybe we are possibly playing with um, deciding whether or not we are heterosexual. I don't know. But I know that everything comes back to, at least for me, what is my motive in this situation? If my motive is to take and not give, that's a problem. That is what I know. That is the bottom line of my sex inventory. Like, that is it, gang. Like, that's the actual exclamation point, spotlight shining on it. For me, that's what it is. And my job as a contributing member to society, hopefully these days, and not somebody who is, you know, not contributing positively to the stream of life. My job is to be a giver and not a taker. And that comes to all of my personal endeavors as well. Sometimes, depending on what the situation is, a little sidebar, self-care will look like taking, but self-care is actually just filling my cup so that I have something to give. But in this case, with this sex and other harms, final third of this fourth step pizza, I look to be a giver and not a taker because I'm just here to tell you I've spent my time taking in this area because I have wanted things, because I have used my sexuality in the past to get what I think I want or what I think I need. I don't think I'm alone in that. In fact, I know that I'm not alone in that. Um, I've sat through way too many meetings, done way too many workshops, and been in way too many process groups. So what we want to look at And so again, this is going to involve some writing, is we want to look at the nature of each relationship that we can recall, dating back to whenever it was that we became sexually active. And here's the thing, you do not need to write down, you know, here's who it was, this is exactly what we did, this is the positions we did. This is not what I'm talking about, okay? We want to look at how did the relationship begin, okay? What were my feelings? Was I emotionally attracted to this person, sexually attracted to this person? Did it start with one and then involve the other, okay? What were our motives for getting involved, because we maybe are 
addicted to love in some cases, or we just kind of fell into love by nature of connection. What was my specific conduct in the relationship? Okay, so, so far we're describing the nature of the relationship, how we met, how it began. What were my motives for getting involved? And what was my specific conduct? Then I want to look at what happened and how did it end? Okay, so what was the fallout? What was the end result? Now, after we've done all of that with every sexual partner that we can recall, or this also is kind of a catch-all section for other relationships. So maybe it's somebody that we didn't list in our resentments because we don't have a resentment against them, but we have a relationship with them that maybe needs a little further exploring, right? So you would put that person here too. All right, so after we've written a little bit about that, about each relationship, we want to ask ourselves, where was I selfish? Where within the scope of that relationship or sexual relationship was I selfish? Where had I been dishonest? And this, I'm talking about like rigorous honesty. So I'm talking about the whole gamut of all the things. Where was I not communicating? Where I should have been communicating? Where was I maybe taking what I needed and wanted and putting it ahead of somebody else's needs and wants? Okay, any form of dishonesty. Next question is, where had I been inconsiderate? Next question is, whom did I hurt? And where did I arouse jealousy? Did I arouse suspicion? Did I arrive at bitterness? Where was I at fault? And finally, what should I have done instead? And that's kind of the key, right? Instead of having a selfish motive, if for the sake of this example I had one, what should I have done instead? And do you know what it requires to be able to see that? It requires a different perspective, which means I'm going to have to look at these relationships from an entirely different angle. So I've used this example before, but it's as if you witness a car accident and you're standing on one side of the road. You need to be able to stand on the other side of the road and look at the other person's perspective of what happened, of what behaviors were conducted, right? So again, the second part of those questions, the real introspective parts are where had I been selfish? Where had I been dishonest? Inconsiderate? Whom did I hurt? Did I arouse jealousy? Did I arouse suspicion and bitterness? Did I arrive at a place of bitterness? Was I at fault? Actually, where was I at fault? Because I pretty much was at fault in all my relationships at some level. Again, using that car accident uh, metaphor, you know, insurance adjusters don't come back to you and say, usually... It was 100% this person's fault, right? (laughs) Usually it's like, okay, even if it looks pretty close, it's like 92%, right? 
And really where the rubber meets the road is, what should I have done instead? Now, are we striving for absolute perfection in this area? Of course not. Is it possible to be perfect in this area? Of course not. This is another one of those areas, you guys, that is a lifelong journey. And also, depending on our age, our desires for sex, our sexual behaviors, our sexual practices, all of this is going to be subject to change, right? Our partners, life will unfold and with it, our humanity unfolds, we grow, we change, and so does our sex life. And so it is our job to be a responsible citizen of our own personal conduct in the area of sex as well as everything else. And so I owe it to myself, to my partner, to everybody else who I associate with, who I'm in relationship or communion with to be the best possible version of myself that I can possibly be. Ultimately, you know what that means? It means I'm going to have to have a power greater than myself (laughs) because I'm human, right? And I just naturally want to take more of my share of the instincts. My instincts get out of whack so fast, even at this long sober, a dozen years sober, my instincts will get totally off kilter at the drop of a hat. Emotional sobriety is a lifelong journey. And so this is just something for you to chew on. This is something for you to think about. And if you do the steps, it has been my experience. If you do them with your whole soul, they will not turn out void. You will experience a spiritual awakening as a result of the step work. So as we're kind of wrapping this up, I just want to remind you guys that If you're hung up on the God thing, don't be. You can just set it aside. You don't have to have it be any kind of a, oh, wait a minute, I wasn't sure about this God thing. Just any higher power, just realizing that we are imperfect and we're never going to be perfect. And even a higher power doesn't make us perfect, (laughs) right? We are just doing the best that we can to be merchants of hope in all of our endeavors. I just want to end on this note, you guys, that we are miracles. We are miracles for even wanting to become recovered citizens of this planet. And that's why I want to encourage you to see your past differently. When you do this fourth step and then you share it in the fifth step with another human being, you will be able to see that your past has become your greatest asset. Why? Because it gives you fuel for the future. Only when we go back and we sort through this stuff are we then able to to create a different story going forward. And that's empowering. And really, what could be more divine than that? Okay, guys, so for your bailout bag, remember to be kind, rewind. I thank you for the honor of your time and take what you like and leave the rest behind. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. 
Keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do. Listener.